Hi there. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joanna Ayersman. And I'm Leah Alter. And this is Women Share, a marketing guide for women in financial services. We are so thrilled to have Lisa Gilbert joining us on Women Share today. Lisa has built a decades long career exclusively in the financial services industry. She's really done it all. She spent over a third of her time working directly in successful wealth management practices, leading client service and relationship management efforts. This experience sparked her passion for helping advisors best serve their clients and achieve their goals. She then spent the next 13 years in the home office of an independent broker dealer and RIA serving in roles in compliance, operations, and learning development. Her comprehensive combination of experience working in advisory businesses and understanding the BDRIA ecosystem uniquely positioned her for a leadership role in their consulting and practice management division, where she leveraged Actify's SuccessPro platform to codify and standardize the consulting process. After leaving that role, Lisa once again, returned to the wealth management side of the world, serving as an operation and investment expert in the 401k space. Like I said, she's done it all. (laughs) However, it wasn't long before her path once again crossed with Actify. And she now is the strategic consultant helping many of the biggest firms in the financial services industry best drive advisor engagement, retention, and growth. Lisa lives in Orlando, Florida with her husband, Trent, and her two adorable kids, Eleanor and Isaac. She is a talented and published makeup artist, although she (laughs) says she's retired. I am retired. A Potterhead and a Diz nerd. (laughs) Um, And I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Lisa for the last 13 years. And if you remember my advice from episode one, not your circus, not your monkeys, it was Lisa who said (laughs) this to me. Our relationship has been many things, many, many things, colleagues. She was my supervisor. And our relationship has changed and the dynamic has changed so many times over the years. But what hasn't changed is a love and a friendship and a respect And I just appreciate her so, so much. I'm so excited that you all are going to get to meet her too. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Make me sound old with all those years of experience. (laughs) Well, I'm older than her too. So that makes you feel a little better. (laughs) Well, Lisa, I like your background fascinates me. And I'm so excited to hear from you because you, you, as Leah said, you've seen so many sides of the industry. So just lay the groundwork for us. Like what brought you to the industry and what has kept you here? Tell us about your career in financial services. What brought me was total accident. Uh, my brother. <laughs> so when I started out, I was, uh, when I started working back in my teen years and through um, almost 20 years old, I was in the skateboarding industry. So I could build you a complete deck. I could help you pick your trucks, your deck. I was the best at doing grip tape and taking it off. I was fantastic at that. And I thought that I would go up through the business side of skateboarding. Contrary to popular belief, it's not very lucrative in the skateboarding industry. Um, And I was in junior college and my brother, so this was in the late 90s. So my brother was finishing up his finance degree at SMU in Dallas. And so he was doing his college internship and he was doing it for three, a team of three brokers. And I intentionally use the word broker because back then advisory hadn't really taken off yet. So it's still very much transactional business. And so my brother was cold calling and they were three, you know, they weren't rookies in the bullpen and they weren't established advisors. So they're there like just starting, starting out. So they were sharing um, an assistant or about to, and he knew I was, you know, kind of stalled in the skate industry. I'm shocking. And um, so he suggested that my semester was, was nearing an end when I was going to school during the day and suggested I just interview for this assistant position. I was like, what the heck? I'll do it. So I interviewed for the position. I ended up getting it. Um, shocking. I had really, really no office experience, but I did get the job, but I had to wait to finish school. So between the time I finished my semester and the time I actually started, there was an assistant from another branch. It was a big, big national wirehouse, lots of branches everywhere. She had left her advisor and 
come over to the team that I was supposed to work with. And so I, I didn't really have a job, but they had already hired me. And so I showed up and I didn't really have that much to do, but there was an assistant that worked for the largest producing team in the branch. And she was pregnant and going on maternity leave in two months. And so they're like, well, I guess you can work here and then, you know, sit in for her when she's on maternity leave. And I was like, well, I guess I have to. So I'm sitting there first day or two of work and the lead advisor, the patriarchy of the, the patriarch of the team comes up to my desk, barely introduces his name and says, you will be registered by September. And it was July. <laughs> so and this is that old school mentality. And, and I'm not going to say his name because he's actually truly a lovely man, but he scared the crap out of me at that moment. So, of course, I hit the book, started studying. I was licensed by September. <laughs> And so that was two months. I did get my seven and I started working for them and ended up staying even when she came back from maternity. So I worked for seven years with these advisors, but t after two years working with them at the broker dealer, they transitioned to another broker dealer. And so it was in that role that I had experience picking up and taking advisors business from one custodian to another and all the stress on both the clients and the advisors and the staff and had gone through that experience, which will have proven to be helpful for me in my later career in training and development. So I worked with them for a, a total seven years, um, and that was in Dallas, and I decided it was time to move to Austin. Why not? You're in Texas. Everyone moves to Austin. I did it a little bit before all the Californians did it, so I'm going to pull my hipster card on that one, <laughs> um, but moved to um, Austin, and at that point, I, I kind of had hit a fork in the road, and I was like, well, maybe I'll leave the industry. Um, maybe I'll do something else, Or, um, but Mark Doobie, who's um, a good friend of mine from Dallas, and he'd, he'd been working at NFP, now Kestra. And I had posted on MySpace at the time a bulletin that I was looking for a job. I was moving. And this is I'm aging myself. And um, he said, come work at NFP. And I applied there. The role that was open was a compliance role. And I, it was pretty much fear that made me stay in the industry. And so I applied. I, I needed a paycheck. I didn't know what to do. So I was like, well, I'll apply there. And when I got in that role, again, this was still – advisory was in, in its adolescence, maybe not its infancy anymore, but NFP needed help with what, what were they doing on their advisory compliance side? And having worked in one of those big broker dealers before and helping my advisor start that advisory process, the conversion from transactional to advisory, I was getting these exception reports that I would have to answer to in operations. So C shares and advisory accounts, concentrated cash positions, inactivity, things like that. So I got that knowledge, brought it to NFP and was like, well, we could start monitoring these things. It's a place. And I had, um, so I built Excel spreadsheets and I will say, I, I called my dad almost every day on the phone, dad, how do you write this formula? And my dad would literally be sitting on the TV, like sitting on the couch watching TV. And I could picture him. He closes his eyes and he can write formulas in his head. Like that's how smart he is. So I would just type in what he said and the formulas would work. So it created a very manual exception reporting process. So worked in, in compliance. And that's where I started to really get a passion for it because at the time. Wait, wait, wait. Passion from compliance? Wait, wait. Okay. Okay. Yes, that I'm sounds so weird. Okay. Sounds weird. No, but no, no. This, I love business. it though. <laughs> no, and the yeah. reason is, is I, I really did like helping advisors and, and many, most of the advisors have all their clients' best interests at heart and they just want to do what's right. It's just the industry is constantly changing. Regular, uh, regulatory industry is constantly changing and they don't know what to do. And yeah. NFP does and still, and I will say, you know, Mike Pedlo, the chief compliance officer over there is so amazing at working with the business and compliance that, I mean, there's no more popular chief compliance officer, but he wasn't there yet. But we were starting that, um, compliance mindset of being not I want to say too business friendly but being business understanding and like hey help us resolve this with you we're not here to give you the hammer we'll help help you resolve and so I said Mike wasn't there yet a position opened up because my boss at the time had left and so I really was trying to uh, get over my skis there and apply for this this VP position that I was in no way um, prepared for yet so didn't get the job went to Mike Pedlow and rightly so 
But in that interviewing process, I got to interview with a lot of the executive leadership at NFP. And I was essentially cherry picked out of my role in compliance and moved to training and development. And the reason for that is how do we correct the behavior? How do we move and not necessarily correct the behavior, but how do we teach best practices and who better to do it than someone who has sat in those seats and done those roles? Because it's one thing to preach from the ivory tower, but it's another thing to lead from the front and actually have done it. So built out their training and development group that naturally spun into advisor education and practice consultant and practice management. Those two, I think, go hand in hand. And we also partnered with the onboarding team to do advisor and staff onboarding education. Um, having gone through the onboarding experience, I did help them build that, um, again, that it, that timeline of taking into consideration what actually happens in a transition. And you can't force information in someone's brain when their hair is on fire during a transition for the first couple of weeks, especially if they're protocol. That's uh, spent 13 years. That's kind of <laughs> a long 13 years at, at NFP and then Kestra went through that rebrand, had the utmost pleasure of working with Leah, who surprised me, you know, more than I think any any colleague has surprised me in their career of, of what she was able to do and how she evolved. So you're amazing. Um, but then left, I left Kestra and went to work for one of their advisors in the 401k space, who I, I love dearly, a fantastic person. But my path crossed with Actify again, and they asked me to come join them to help them help the other broker dealers, the other people in um, maybe consulting leadership roles, build out their strategy and leverage the platform the best way they can. And now I'm here. <laughs> so um, long winded. <laughs> No, but I think it's I, I think it's really a, a great also story in terms of like, you know, following a path that maybe you didn't know you were going to follow. You know, I joke all the time with you about being such a natural leader and I've had the opportunity to have you be a leader of me and my career and it, it comes very naturally to you. So I am interested um, about what you've learned in your career about being a good leader or a bad leader, either way. <laughs> um, I know you've had both, too. Um, yeah. And specifically, as a woman in the industry, has yeah. your approach to leadership evolved over the years? Okay. Well, thank you. You're too kind to me. But um, I think like with with my leadership style and what I think that is the underpinning of all great leaders and the lack of it is really the hallmark of bad leaders is trust. It is the foundation of everything and it it's a it differentiates you between a great leader and a bad one. And I always strive to be very high trust. And I think that starts with authenticity. Um, I don't know how to pretend to be anything other than I am. I am a lot of things. I'm rough around the edges. I am not someone that you want in earshot of your HR department. I am colorful. <laughs> I have a lot of four-letter four -letter words in my vernacular, and I'm trying to get better at that. But I am who I am. And I think that I think that authenticity shows through. I think people can can, you know, sense fraud or someone pretending to be something they're not. Um, so I think that serves me both well, and it also has been a disservice to me at times, but it is what it is. And I think I'm very transparent and sometimes to a fault, but people know what I'm thinking. I'm direct. I will soften when I need to, but I'm, I don't try to sugarcoat anything. Um, I think also trust, and, and I think it, it shows through in some of my career path is I roll up my sleeves and I do the thing, right? I do the work and I don't feel like I can be an authentic or trustworthy leader if I'm not willing to do the work myself. And I lead from the front. And if I, if I'm going to ask you to do it, I'm going to get in there and do it with you, especially if things go like we're a small organization at Actify. And there are absolutely within my role, I have full authority to delegate you know, configure this dashboard or do this. And I don't, I do it when I have the time because I just, that's just what I think, um, that's what I do. And I want to step in and do it myself. Has my style evolved, especially as a woman? Absolutely. I think I was much more in my younger years, a bull in a China shop. And I have, I find that women are better listeners. And I always ask Eleanor um, when she's, 
talking and talking and talking or having a problem or whatever, I always ask her, I was like, how many ears do you have? And she says two. And I said, how many mouths do you have? And she says one. And I said, which one should you be using more? And I think that applies to adults too. And if you if you ever sit in a meeting, whether it's with a client or a prospective client or um, you know, someone at a at a home office or, or you know, executives or whoever, I always find that a lot of times and I'm not going to say it's uh, along gender lines, but I feel like there's a lot of times people are fighting for airspace in the room and they're trying to talk. And I felt like when I was younger, especially that I had to speak up and I had to, you know, have my go out on a high note Costanza moment or whatever. And I have found that most people give positive feedback on a meeting if they do the most talking <laughs> and if they do the most speaking. So if you do more listening, and I feel like I try to do that now, obviously this podcast is not a great example, but if I am doing more listening, I can take in, I can hear facts, I can get information that I might not have heard if I was speaking. They leave with the feeling that I've given good meeting. And I have a lot more to take back and say, okay, next time I speak to them, these are what I'm going to tell them their ideas inspired me to do. Or these are some things I think we could do to make your life easier. And I think it's become a lot more effective and it gets people behind me a lot easier than if I'm just talking at them. Especially, I'll just add this in too. Lisa's always the one that's going to ask you the question that no one else is going to (laughs) ask in a meeting. And she gets that information because she's paying attention. I've been in many, many meetings with you over the years where I think everyone walked into a meeting thinking it was about one thing. <laughs> and then the qu- the question <laughs> that no one thought of comes and it takes us in a different direction. It's always super powerful and something I've I've learned from you over the years of how to apply in my my own career. I think that's when the first time I was called a disruptor. And that was when that wasn't really like the industry buzz term yet. Um, So I was kind of offended when the executive called me a disruptor. Uh, But then through speaking to him in subsequent meetings, it was just that. Like, I can't, and this serves me well sometimes and also probably causes anxiety other times, is I can't think about just the step in front of me. My brain goes, well, what's the next one and the next one and the next one? And doing that critical thinking several steps down the line, again, sometimes that does probably create anxiety, but other times that helps you think, you ask those questions that other people don't think of because you're not just thinking of the immediate answer. Mm -hmm. And so I think being quiet and having that time to think is also, you're able to do that when you're not speaking. You know, it's interesting. This is making me think because I would say typically women are encouraged, like, speak more, speak up, you know, like we tend to take. And so I love that you bring this perspective of someone who has had the opposite paradigm. And I also wonder, like, I wonder how often men are thinking about how much they're speaking or listening or not. Like, how, like how, you know, we. I don't want to get in trouble. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. Um, yeah. I don't think that probably crosses their mind as, as much. And, you know, I'm not telling any women don't speak up because I absolutely don't want to be accused of saying that. It's like, but when you speak up, mean it, speak up with assertiveness and don't just talk to talk. And, and I would have, I would do that in the past. Mm. And I sometimes just have to slow myself down by listening and frame up what I'm going to say so that it is impactful or it is insightful or it does inspire the conversation to go in a different way instead of just, like I said, fighting for airspace. Leah and I are both marketers, right? So we spent a, a good part of our careers helping advisors grow. Would love to hear in your experience at Actify, like what are you seeing? How are you helping institutions who are working with advisors who are seeking to grow? Yeah. So from the if you're looking at the coach or an, or a consultant or relationship manager capacity where you're doing that one-on-one with the advisor, one of our tactics is work with the willing, right? We have a concept of readiness, which is will, skill, capacity. So a lot of people are going to say, if you said, you know, hey, who wants to grow in a room at a conference? Like everyone's going to raise their hand. I want to grow. But if you ask the right questions and really get under the hood of the car, you're probably going to find out that some people just want to be on their boat on the weekends or on the golf course at three o'clock or, you know, helping out with their kids school or whatever. And they want to run a lifestyle practice 
or yeah. they say they want to grow, but they can't even open an account or an onboard and a client efficiently. And the last thing you want to do is fill their pipeline with a bunch of people that are going to have a negative client experience. So I think helping them and then, you know, from the from the institution side, they have limited headcount and resources. You can't go hand to hand combat one to one with every advisor. So you might have a team of eight, 10, you know, 20 people servicing anywhere from 200 to 16,000 advisors. And so you need to work with the people that are actually willing and ready to grow. And so we help with our assessments and our tools to one, uncover who those folks that are really ready to grow and have the will, skill, capacity to do so. And then once you find out who's ready, it's what matters to them. Because you could go preaching your best practices. And okay, I think I've seen this a lot at every organization, not just the ones I've been at is, okay, we're launching this technology, we've got to push this. And this is our initiative. And they wonder why at the end of the day, it's not getting adopted at the rate that they wanted to. Well, maybe it is within the circles of people that really need it. But maybe you're trying to push it on everybody and it's square peg round hole. Or maybe they do need it, but they're not thinking of that right now. So helping them prioritize and meet the advisor where they're at by the advisor literally raising their hand and telling you in writing, this is what's important to me. This is what I'm willing to do. Your conversations, maybe it's a reach out. I see a lot of them, they have to reach out proactively to advisors. Your conversation is going to land a lot better if it's focused on what they want to talk about. So many advisors think, oh, the home office visit is just going to come tell me what they their initiatives. Make it about them. The other play that we do is is that scale play, right? Everyone's talking about the scale play. What about those people that don't get our coverage model and we need to service all these other people from an advisor-led perspective? So giving them the same tools that are maybe just advisor-led could be consumed from SSO, from their, their portal, where the advisor could diagnose what they need to work on in their practice, or maybe if it's a uh, discipline-specific assessment or you know, intake form or whatever it is so that they can um, figure out what is important to the advisors and either match their resources because that's another huge problem is they have our firms or, you know, all the firms in the industry have very rich platform and resources that the advisors either don't know about or aren't utilizing. Mm -hmm. So how can we match the problem with the solution and get it into the hands of the advisors when they need it? You can do that through our technology, either from a self-serve or a, you know, employee to advisor experience. So in a nutshell, that's how we're we're helping them. And then of course we have a lot of custom bespoke solutions that that's a lot of part of, uh, part of my job is to talk to our clients and be like, okay, what's your pain and how can we solve it? Because we are very nimble. We're very small. We can move very quickly. Our ultimate goal is to partner with their technology and become integrated and, and feed them data to their native software. But in the meantime, we can work a lot faster. So, so if I'm an advisor listening to this, mm-hmm. I'm like, ooh, she gets to see all this behavior of advisors, right? So I'm curious, are there um, commonalities or habits among advisors who are growing their business yep. at a higher rate? Yes. And I will say there's probably three things that jump out at me really quickly. The first one is have a plan. So I, I, I'm i not going to try to pronounce the name of the author, but he's the French uh, French guy that, that wrote The Little Prince. And he was quoted saying, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And to me, that's something that I always think about because it's true. Like, um, if you have a goal, but you don't write it down, everyone heard about SMART goals, but then, okay, you've got your SMART goal. What are the underlying tasks to achieve the goal? What is the tactic? What are the strategies? How am I going to know if I'm on or off track? So have a plan and it be very specific on what your milestones are. It's not only for understanding whether you're on or off track, but it's for taking the wins. It works also for, you know, the home office, the institutions to take those wins and be that accountability partner for the advisor. And to that end, like democratize and involve your team. If you have a team of people that are rowing the boat with you, get them involved. So many advisors I see just kind of hold everything like, well, this is the the running the business. I've got to do all of this. No, you don't. And in fact, it's probably better if you don't, because there are certain aspects of the business of, of anybody running the business that somebody's just not going to want to do and not going to like. And there's someone else probably working with you or around you that would really 
enjoy doing that type of work. And also people get a huge sense of satisfaction from contributing to a goal and being part of the, the bigger story. So involve your team and don't think that you have to, you know, of course, where it's appropriate, um, but don't think that you have to do everything on your own and assign some of those tracks, those tasks out because people, like I said, they want to help and they want to be part of the success. And the third thing is look at your numbers, look at your data and do it regularly. I know I, I, the, the, Cobbler's kids have no shoes. The dentist kids have bad teeth. They're fantastic at telling their clients, you need to be looking at your, your financials. You need to be sticking to your plan. You need to be doing all this stuff, but they're not doing it for themselves and their businesses. And their business and their practice is their number one asset in life. And so monitor your key metrics, at least quarterly. Know your client profitability. Know what your average client rates. And if there are clients that are not profitable to you, figure out how to offboard them or have a junior producer or, uh, you know, promote a staff person to an associate advisor or, you know, to a, another trusted advisor, you know, whatever the case may be. And a lot of firms have small account solutions, maybe that. So look at your data and know if you need to make pivot to make decisions. So, you know, those are kind of my three things is have a plan, involve your team and look at your numbers, look at your data regularly. And if you don't know how, how to, to find your data, like reach out to your institution because they probably have financial metrics and there's benchmarking and there's guidance from investment news to really data, whatever that you can see where you're stacking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and your point of just having like baking that into your process, like what would you say of some of the top performing advisors, like in the, in a typical week, how much time are they spending on kind of that? part of the business of analyzing their, their data and looking at their growth and reviewing the plan. Like I, I believe like once you get into it, it, it doesn't have to be this yeah. huge. It doesn't have to be that much. No, it's probably a couple hours a week. If you've, if you've done it for a while and that's, you know, a couple hours out of one day or 30 minutes a day or, you know, an hour a day, whatever, that's not that much time in the grand scheme of things to make sure that you're, you know, you're tracking and you're, you're performing to plan. But the beginning, it could, it could be quite an effort to stand it up. But then again, like a lot of these institutions have the resources to help advisors do that. And it's not that yeah. big of a lift. Yeah. So raise your hand, like ask the question. Mm -hmm. and see if mm -hmm. they have those resources. But I mean, I think it could probably only be like an, and maybe a couple hours a week. Right. Right. And Not some of the much. top performing practices that I worked with, it's like they have, it's their, it's their Monday meeting. And to your point mm -hmm. of bringing in your, your team, right. Sharing the data broadly within your practice, being like, here's how we're doing. We're tracking. We're not in like Exactly. It doesn't all have to fall on the leader's shoulders, right. It can be a collaborative effort, which increases engagement and buy-in and anyway. Yes. Right. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit. Um, one of the questions we love to ask every guest is what is the best career advice you've ever received? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do it by decade, I guess, because I've had a lot. So the first, so the first one. By decade. <laughs> do it by decade. My first decade into my career. Well, this is actually pre, this is pre financial services. So it was in the skate industry, which is probably not where you would think like nuggets of career wisdom would come from. But my manager at the time, Mike Beadle said, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're history. <laughs> and he said this to me. Now, maybe that was because I was a teenager working in retail and like teenagers are notoriously late. I wasn't ever. But I think what that, and I, I still say it, I quote it, <laughs> I quote it still in my job here at Actify 30 years later. I think it shows respect of other people's time. My time is not more important than anybody else's time. So I don't care if it's a meeting with people that are have titles higher than mine or lower than mine. Mine is not important than anybody else's. And I try my best to be early, a minute or two early to every Zoom. Um, sometimes I'm not, and I get it. Things happen. But I try to be on time, if not early. Decade two. So don't come with solutions. Don't come with problems, come with solutions. And I think this was right around that disruptor time. I think about this one all the time before I give my feedback or my opinions, because I have a lot of them. I have a lot of opinions, but nobody wants someone to just come in and tell them that their baby's ugly. 
come in with, okay, if this doesn't work for you and this doesn't make sense, what would? And even if your solution doesn't get chosen or it's not viable, that doesn't mean, you know, you still came with an idea and you didn't just lob crap over the fence and say, you know, here, this sucks, get over it. (laughs) The third one, this is going to sound a little bit harsh, but it's true. Nobody gives a shit about your career more than you. It's true. Nor should they. And when the first person said this to me, and I think, Leah, I probably said this to you in one-on-one that we had many times, and it's true. I should not care more than Leah should about her career or Joanna, you should. You you have to care about it more than anyone else. I am not your mom, and I'm not going to tell you what to do and pull you along. So take ownership and care about it. Don't expect other people to hand you things or that you deserve the promotion because you've worked there 13 years, right? Nobody's going to care like you do. And then the, finally, this is the one that I think is the most recent in this last um, last couple of years, actually, is define your values and live in alignment, live and work in alignment with those. And this is something that I've done. We actually do here at Actify. We work with the Think to Perform, and we all have to do the values cards exercise. And even if you know pretty much what your values are, maybe you don't have them boiled down to succinct one word responses, or maybe you can't articulate them very um, easily. So this is a great way to, to write down, you know, your top five from a one word perspective. What are your top five values? And post those on a piece of paper, post those where you can see them. We have we have them in our um, success pro for our own personal um, development on our dashboards. But you know, number one is my number one value is family. Now, it wasn't that way six years ago before I had my children. So now my time is protected. Previously, I would be pretty much available 24-7. If you text me, if you email me, I would jump in my computer and, and answer that email. But my organization now knows respectfully, like, of course, if there's an issue, I will do that. But, you know, six o'clock, I got to feed my kids, bathe them. That's my time, my time with my kids. And so if you get out of alignment with your values, it's not going to be a good place. You're not going to be performing your best and you're not going to want to stay there. Okay. I love all of those. I don't think I have a favorite. So thank you for sharing (laughs) so many of this. Um, This has been such an amazing conversation, Lisa, as I knew it would be. Thank you so much for being here. That is our show for today. (laughs) If ours is a mission that you want to share in, please subscribe at whatever platform you get your podcasts. And with that, I'm Leah Alter. And I'm Joanna Ayersman, and we will catch you on the next episode of Women Share.